Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mari Cross, and I chair the uh, Future Proofing Europe series, which is a series uh, that we have uh, supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and very much dedicated, as you can see from the title, Future Proofing Europe. Uh, and um, as I say, you're welcome today, as is um, the audience on Zoom, uh, to our enlargement and reform, why it matters and how it can be done. And uh, we are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Anna Luhrmann, who is the Minister of State for Europe and Climate of Germany, and who has been generous enough to take time out of her schedule to speak to us today. So Dr. Luhrmann will address us for approximately 20 minutes, uh, followed by a question and answer session. And uh, your participation is very much encouraged. Um, and also to the audience on Zoom, um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in uh, throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once Dr. Lehrman has finished her presentation. And a reminder that today's presentation uh, and both the Q&A are on the record. Uh, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming this morning's discussion uh, um, on um, via YouTube. Um, so the European Union, as we're all very much aware, is currently debating two inextricably connected issues of EU enlargement and reform. And these discussions are taking place against the background of challenging geopolitical situation with wars in Central Europe and in the Middle East. And in her address to the IIEA, as part of the Future Proofing Europe project, uh, Dr. Lerman um, will present views, German perspective on these questions and the challenges facing Europe in this moment of what is definitely global turmoil. Uh, some, I, it's a pleasure now to present uh, Dr. Lerman. Uh, the minister is a German political scientist and a member of Alliance 90, the Greens, and she has been serving in the Bundestag since the 2021 German federal election. And she holds, as we have said, the position of Minister of State in the uh, Federal Foreign Office in the cabinet of, of Chancellor Schulz. Um, it's um, of interest to note, it's your se second time that um, Dr. Lerman has been in the Bundestag. And I think um, worth mentioning that she made history in 2002 as the youngest ever member of the Bundestag. Um, after she uh, left then to pursue um, academic career, and she holds a number of degrees. Uh, she has a PhD from Humboldt University. Uh, and also a BA from the University of Hagen, a master's degree in gender and peace studies from Ahad U University for Women in Sudan, uh, which is of particular interest, and an MA in research training in social sciences, also from Humboldt University in Berlin. And from 2018 to 2021, she served as an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Gothenburg and is the Deputy Director of the Varieties of Democracy Institute from 2018 to 2020. Uh, I think as is clear from um, Dr. Luhrmann's uh, academic career that uh, her research interests include very much democratic resilience, uh, elections, regime legitimacy and democracy, which is very relevant uh, to our discussion today. So, Minister, the floor is yours, and we look forward very much to hearing your presentation. Yes, I think so. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear guests, dear friends, I'm very, very happy to be here uh, today. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure uh, to, to be received here to discuss with you. 
Um, and uh, these are really issues that you outlined that are on top uh, of our agenda and, and on top mm -hmm. of, of my mind. And I would like to start um, by sharing uh, some um, insights from, from my trip to uh, Kiev a year ago. That was uh, almost exactly uh, a year ago together with actually uh, uh, female colleagues in the General Affairs Council, so other female EU ministers. And we went to, to Kiev and of course uh, there was a, a, a bomb attack uh, from, from Russia uh, and um, we did what Ukrainians are, have become accustomed to do now. We went to a bomb shelter onto the parliament and of course for us it was, okay, we're going to sit there now and in silence and, and wait. And But the Ukrainians were like, no, 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 we will continue work. We need to um, talk to you about uh, the... Um, changes to uh, our media law. We need to talk to you about how we will appoint our judges, how we uh, will uh, make other rule of law reforms. And at first I was a bit puzzled because I thought, okay, how can we do that while our sort of the life of other Ukrainians is at risk up above us here? But then I really, in these discussions, I really realized that um, what this whole discussion about the EU enlargement actually means for Ukrainians, it it is more than some bureaucratic checking the boxes or something like that. It, it is really this symbol for the hope of a life in peace, of a life in freedom, of a life in dignity uh, as members of the European Union. Uh, sort of to have that, what we often take here for granted uh, in Ireland or in Germany, uh, and what they are currently fighting for, what they're risking their lives for. Um, and this is really this... EU accession process is really the symbol of um, this, um, this promise. Um, and I think it's really our duty here, um, sitting uh, in, in our warm and cozy homes in Ireland or Germany to make sure that we keep this promise and that we work together on ways how Ukraine can actually achieve this. Um, and, um, and it's really um, something that is that we do um, because uh, we want to support Ukrainians as our friends, but also because we know it strengthens our own stability and security if we make sure that uh, our immediate neighborhoods, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Georgia, also countries of the Western Balkans are safe and secure within the EU instead of unstable um, outside under the influence of countries that don't have the best intentions for us and our future. And therefore, I really believe that um, this EU enlargement uh, is um, a key uh, issue that we need to work on. Uh, it will expand our area of freedom, security, uh, and also justice. Um, and um, it's clear that for that, the Canada countries need to do a lot of reforms. Course, as I told you now, the Ukrainians are really working very hard on it. Um, also uh, in, in Moldova, they made good progress. That's also why we're going to start the accession uh, negotiations now um, very soon. Uh, also Georgia has candidate status. Um, uh, when we turn our, our um, attention towards the countries of the Western Balkans, then we see a bit of mix back. You know, these countries have been uh, on their way to the EU for more than 20 years now. They had this promise uh, in Thessaloniki back at a conference. Uh, and they haven't really made it yet into the EU, as we all know. And that is partially because there were um, stumbling blocks from the side of the EU uh, over and again and um, again, but also because at least in some of uh, the countries of the Western Balkans, the reform uh, process, um, let's put it diplomatically, isn't on the highest priority list of uh, the leading politicians in those countries. And of course, the, the most important uh, country here, Serbia, uh, gave a, a very bad example of, of that um, now just before Christmas when elections took place in a way that uh, the international observers uh, have raised a lot of doubts about the credibility of the electoral results. And I really think that that's uh, unacceptable that a country that wants to become uh, an EU member holds an election in a way 
that um, actually um, uh, doesn't um, fulfill the, the standards for, for credible elections, because that's the very basis of what we're doing here, the basis of democracy is free and fair elections. And if we can't be sure that the re result actually reflects the will of the people, because there were reports of um, busing of, of people from uh, other parts of the country to the capital, there were reports, uh, also uh, very credible reports, and we, we know it actually as a fact that opposition uh, politicians have much less access to the media, for instance, than government politicians and all that. And that's really something that uh, during this enlargement process needs to um, change. And that also shows, uh, again, the whole power of this enlargement process. I mean, we support those that want to move closer to our values, to our standards. But at the same time, we also give incentive to those that might need a little incentive here and make it clear that if you want to achieve the benefits of the single market, for instance, of um, traveling freely in Europe and these kind of things, then you really need to make sure that you also make progress on these uh, reforms. Um, so my first big point is yes to enlargement and yes uh, to enlargement because it is also in our own security and, and stability interests. The second point um, is that we also need to be aware that if we enlarge our EU, a larger EU, doesn't automatically mean that it's also a stronger EU, right? That's the goal we want to achieve. We want to strengthen our union with the enlargement. But this, there's no automatism. Uh, we also need to do our homework as EU if we want to achieve this. Uh, you know, already now, and I know there are some uh, people who have a lot of experience also in, uh, in the EU institutions here in this room, uh, already now the process in Brussels often are too slow, uh, a bit sluggish. It's, um, there's room for improvement already now. But I think if we have some process now that looks like a detour when we're 27 members, this might actually turn out to be a dead end when we're more than 27 members, right? So a little bit like you, if you want to prepare to, to go to sail um, on the high seas, then you better have a boat that doesn't already look a bit shaky when it's somewhere on, on a little lake or a little river in, in, in inland, right? So, so we really want to make sure that our institutions, our processes, our structures are ready uh, for enlargement, are ready for, uh, for 30 or, or 35 uh, members. Um, and we need to start this discussion now uh, so that we can say we are ready once the candidate countries are ready with their reforms. Um, and that, of course, means that we need to think about the size of the European Parliament uh, with new members. I mean, it's one of the most obvious things to talk about, the size and the functioning of the commission. Do we really want to have 35 commissioners sitting around the table? Is that an efficient way of governing Europe? Not really sure. Can we find some other solutions here? And of course, we also need to think about uh, these vetoes because we often see now, and I think we've had a very stark example of that before Christmas, uh, that individual countries use this right uh, to actually um, block um, the whole of the EU moving forward. And maybe for reasons that are not even related to the issue that actually is being voted on, right? So I think we really need to think about how we can ensure that every country is seen, that every national interest is seen, but in a way that doesn't allow for these blockades that slow us down overall. So we need to talk about vetoes and about increasing the use of qualified majority voting. Uh, and therefore, um, we're working very actively on that already in some areas of the foreign policy um, topics. We also want to work on this in the fiscal area. Uh, and also think about um, other issues where, where we can reduce um, the veto. Um, and in particularly when we think about, uh, we just had a very lively discussion also on, on all the global challenges that, we're, that faces the EU. If we really want to be seen as a confident, as, a, as an actor that has an impact actually in this, we need to speak with one voice and we need to work closer together. 
And therefore, together with my French colleague, uh, we've asked a group of experts to already make some suggestions on this. They've presented a quite an interesting report sailing on high seas um, back in, in fall. And now um, we really need to discuss this in all EU member states uh, and think about what kind of EU reform we need. I'm also looking forward to listening to your suggestions uh, later in the, in the Q&A and your points here where you think EU reform is really needed. Um, and uh, the European Council has already decided in December that now uh, these processes, the enlargement and the reform need to go in parallel, so move at the same time. And that the Belgian presidency has asked to um, present us with a roadmap uh, with some idea of how this discussion can continue now um, uh, in June already. So, so this is really a debate that is um, happening. And um, yeah, and here, uh, and that maybe already brings me to my, my third point, um, that is right, enlargement, reform, and all on the on the basis um, on the on the big uh, on the yeah on the basis of our common values. I mean that's what brings us together, right? We are a union of of common values, and here in particularly also the rule of law, which we need to defend against attacks from outside, like Russia, for instance, but also from attacks from inside. Um, and um, therefore, um, we really cannot accept if. EU members repeatedly attack uh, freedom of press uh, or controlling uh, of the judiciary. Um, we really have to uh, use the instruments uh, against these kind of attacks, protect ourselves against this, because only if we stand on the same foundation, on the same values, then we can actually also act uh, strong together. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we should um, use these instruments that we have. I know a lot of you are experts and you've heard about the Article 7 procedure. So it's a, it's a procedure where we can, um, uh, at EU level, when we are concerned with the development of the rule of law or values in general in EU country, we can address this in the Council. Um, and but we have done that now for two countries, for Poland and Hungary, too late, I would say. So already when processes went uh, in the wrong direction for quite some time. Uh, and here these uh, instruments, um, and we can also withhold parts of the budget uh, for these countries because we're actually afraid that um, because of the declines in the rule of law, we actually cannot be sure that the funds of the EU are used in the way that um, they're supposed to be used. And it's our taxpayers, your money, right, that is being used. So therefore, we really need to make sure that it's spent in an appropriate manner. So these instruments, I think we need to, to really apply them uh, more uh, coherently and also think about how we can strengthen them because we cannot afford also in an enlarged EU to have more members uh, and then, you know, just adding more members increases also the risk of these kind of uh, deterioration. So we also need to think about how we can um, improve them, maybe use them uh, more uh, earlier, uh, maybe also reduce the, the, the thresholds that are needed to, to apply them um, so that we really protect the rule of law and, and our, the values on, on the basis that we stand on. And to conclude, um, I think um, I, I want to um, actually um, end um, yeah, with a positive example of where the EU member states have been working very well together, which is addressing the climate crisis. I think here we all agree that this is one of our core challenges at the moment. Uh, and uh, now at the COP28 uh, in, in Dubai, we could really see how when the EU works together, you know, we're negotiating there together as EU, uh, we can actually achieve something. So for the first time now, we have agreed as a world, based also on EU initiatives, EU leadership, EU, EU negotiation skill, uh, that we want to transition away from fossil fuels globally. Also, the oil producing countries have agreed to that. Uh, and now, of course, the action needs to follow this. But here, I'm, I'm also confident based also on 
German Irish cooperation on this field. You know, we had um, had the lead in a working group on so-called loss and damage, or on the way on the question of how we actually um, deal uh, with the losses that already exist because of the climate crisis. We were working together so well that we actually managed to build confidence also of partners in other parts of the world, so that in the end we could achieve this uh, compromise. And now we have to work uh, on the um, action here in this field, uh, mainly um, on renewable energies. That's also what we decided in Dubai, that we want to triple renewables until 2030, that we want to double energy efficiency. Uh, and here, I think uh, we really, um, as uh, Germany and Ireland, we can work together to make this actually a reality on the European continent, uh, to work on, on green energy, on green hydrogen together. This is um, really where also prosperity in the future lies and we and the way how we can make sure that we continue to live on a planet that actually um, has uh, temperatures that uh, we can thrive in as, as human race, right? So um, these are some of the issues that are at stake now uh, when in six months uh, all, or five months even only, European citizens go to the polls for the European Parliament elections. Uh, we will, for the first time in Germany, 16 to 18 year olds can go vote, so young people can uh, participate in this election. I'm very happy about that. This has been uh, something that I've been working on already back in the days when I was a young member of Parliament, one of my most uh, uh, yeah, key uh, agenda items that I've been pushing for. Now I had to wait for 20 years, uh, but it's at least uh, being implemented, so you have to have a uh, yeah, endurance in, in politics, uh, but I'm confident if we work together um, uh, as Germany and Ireland, but also in the European Union, we can achieve um, solutions to all these uh, challenges, uh, and we have done so in the past, uh, and I think that's that's the way forward, and therefore I'm happy to discuss with you these kind of issues now um, here, and looking also forward to your suggestions and ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for that overview. And um, <clears throat> we note the, the points you stressed, um, particularly <clears throat> your commitment to Ukraine and, and a very accelerated um, accession process for Ukraine. And also the fact that um, uh, the, the situation, the war situation has not only uh, brought Ukraine so much closer to the EU, but has also given more momentum to the Balkan states, which, as you mentioned, their membership uh, in that area has been languishing for, for um, about 20 years. Um, <clears throat> the floor is now open for questions, both from our um, in-house uh, audience uh, and, but also our audience on Zoom where uh, questions can be taken. Uh, when you put the question, I would be grateful if you could give your name and affiliation. So we have one first question over here and the microphone is available. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, presentation. My name is Claudia Bodulescu. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at um, the Institute for European Studies in Brussels. Um, I was wondering what are the prospects for Ukraine and Moldova to join the EU? Like, do they have any credible or tangible prospects to join the EU, given that they have contested borders? So um, Ukraine has an active conflict with Russia and Moldova has a frozen conflict with Russia through the separatist region of Transnistria. So what can the EU do really to integrate these countries given these contested borders? And is there any alternative to an EU membership in the meantime? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this microphone is working like That's this, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for this question. Indeed, uh, an important one. And um, uh, I uh, also, um, when we when we think about Georgia, I mean, we often forget uh, uh, about um, about these so-called frozen conflicts there. And when I was in in Georgia recently, I also um, went to uh, to the administrative boundary line with uh, South Ossetia to take a look actually at what what's happening there because. Again, that's also one of the things, you know, sometimes we are like, oh, the EU, is the EU actually doing enough in, in, in terms of foreign policy? And here we are using an instrument very effectively, the EU uh, monitors, uh, it's policemen and women from all over Europe, uh, 
that are active here at this administrative boundary line to actually make sure that uh, the um, uh, that the other side doesn't uh, doesn't cross uh, cross over where they're not supposed to or not doesn't creep into um, uh, into um, uh, the wrong direction um, and uh, and this works this also mediates uh, the conflict there um, and makes sure that it doesn't boil up so I, I just want to mention that here because it's often not known uh, what actually we're, we're doing in um, also effectively in, in terms of conflict prevention and mediation as an EU. This is really uh, quite a, an impressive instrument. Uh, but of course, uh, when we talk about EU membership, this is an issue that, that also needs to be discussed. Uh, what I always say, uh, both in Ukraine and in Georgia, is to um, uh, that really these countries should really focus now on the reforms that they can address on. There's a lot to do particularly also in Georgia, where the government hasn't been so active on the reform front as they could have been, uh, as you know, probably. Uh, and then I'm sure we will find also a solution to, to these issues. Um, uh, we have found a solution to this issue um, when it came to Cyprus, not that I'm advocating to just replicate that model. Um, but uh, really here, my, uh, my answer to this is that um, a bit like we cross the bridge when we get there. Uh, we we have a lot to work on uh, until these countries can um, have the status of having the membership within reach, and then I'm I'm confident we'll find some solution also for for this issue of contested boundaries. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that, Minister. I, we have another question here, Alan, and then. Uh, Alan Dukes, uh, former director of this institute. Minister, you've spoken in the context of enlargement of the need to look at our institutions and processes. And you mentioned specifically uh, the, the, the unanimity rule, uh, the veto. We've seen how uh, the use or misuse of that veto can actually obstruct other areas of policy. I mean, in, in one specific case, um, the application of Article 7 is being compromised severely by the use of the veto because in practical terms, it applies to most of the major economic and foreign policy decisions. If we look at the political landscape in the current EU, and perhaps in some of the members of the candidate states, my view is that we're seeing a move to the right. Um, and it seems to me, and I hope I'm wrong about this, that the further the political center of gravity moves to the right, the more problematic uh, the use of the veto will be. So that we're actually running out of time to do something sensible uh, about broadening the scope uh, of QMV. Um, so far, there has been a huge reluctance in most member states even to mention it. And, and I excuse uh, your native country and France, uh, because they at least have said, maybe we should think about this. The odd thing to my mind is that when people look at vetoes, uh, I observe in Ireland, the people in Ireland who are most vocal in demanding a change in the unanimity rule in the UN Security Council are also the most vocal in saying we have to keep the unanimity rule in the EU, which seems to me to be an odd kind of position to take. But do, do you believe, Minister, that there's any real chance uh, that we will come to some uh, sensible decision about expanding QMV in time uh, to prevent it being overtaken by this movement to the right in the political forces? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um... No, I share your argument um, in that sense that uh, indeed the problem is if the political landscape is becomes more polarized and if you have more people, be it or more parties, be it on the on the extreme right or on the extreme left that uh, can come to power, then um, that makes the um, the unanimity. Uh, more and more problematic because uh, it just means that uh, that governments that might be so far away from the center of European politics can block then then everyone right 
Um, and uh, I don't think it's it's a necessarily just a characteristic of the far right. It could theoretically also be of the far left, which we don't really have uh, in power now um, at the moment. But indeed, that's that's a problem. And that's exactly why we need to think about something that I like to call flexigration. Yeah? So because, you know, before people like to talk about I don't know, Europe of concentric circles. I think also there you you your question went a bit in that direction or whether we need a core Europe, you know, um, uh, the famous Wolfgang Schäuble who, uh, uh, yeah, un unfortunately just passed away. He he was talking a lot about, about this, that we need a core Europe and then something around it. But I think that that doesn't actually address the challenge of today. And the challenge of today is rather that after an election, we could have, and that could happen in France, actually, right? We could have uh, an extreme right uh, party in government that is then far away from the consensus of the rest of the EU. And we need to find answers to that. And I think one answer is the improvement of the rule of law instruments. Uh, and here we can have improvements, and we're working on that with the Belgian presidency as well. We can have improvements that don't require treaty change because these are also relatively new instruments, right? They were just being used for the very first time over the last year. So we can do a lot with um, developing new procedures uh, and, and these kind of things. Um, but in the end, um, we also need some reform that might need then um, a change of, of rules and unanimity. So that's the absurd thing. You need unanimity to change unanimity, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and um, and I, I'm quite optimistic. I mean, you might have realized that I'm an optimist in general, but also in this field, I think I have reasons for that because more and more the point sinks in that we cannot afford to just enlarge the EU um, without uh, getting ready for it. And we will have, I mean, you know how the EU decision-making is, is often made. We will have a point in time also where we will need to have that conversation of, are we ready? Uh, and then uh, there will be a discussion between those that really want the enlargement and tend not to be so keen on, on working on, on, um, on uh, the issue of capacity to act. And... Um, uh, and those that rather prioritize this issue. So um, I think we we need to we need to start this discussion by really thinking about okay, what kind of EU do we want? We want a stronger EU. I think in that we all agree with the EU twenty seven. Uh, and when we want a stronger EU, we, it needs to be bigger and it needs to um, improve its capacity to act. And we have now for the first time in the European Council in December we had the agreement that these discussions at least need to take place in parallel. Uh, and there are also several ways of how we can protect legitimate national interests, for instance, um, uh, without um, leaving those full-scale veto rights without necessary need to justification and these kind of things on the table. There are all sorts of discussions. A lot of work for think tanks, by the way, to really think about these things through how we can in introduce safeguards, for instance, now that we, you know, just from the top of my head, one suggestion could be that we say, okay, uh, in general, we move to qualified majority voting, um, but if a country manages to mobilize five other countries saying that, oh, here, the national interest of one country is really, really challenged and at stake, then some sort of safeguard, for instance, the discussion in the European Council um, is uh, required no? so so i think we need to think a little bit creatively of how we can do this or maybe another idea is to have um to have the veto only veto rights only three times a year per country no that would sort of reduce the possibility i'm just you know just thinking out loud i think we need to we are in a phase at the moment where we need to untap some creativity around this because it is also a legitimate um, grievance that I hear often, uh, particularly in smaller or medium-sized uh, member states, that this is something very dear and, and a safeguard that, that countries don't want to, to give up. Uh, so we need to think about how can we preserve the safeguard mechanism without but reduce its destructive potential. I'm quite sure it can be done.
<laughs> Thank you, Minister. I know we have one other question, but in relation to that, I just wanted to follow up. QMV, as you mentioned, uh, makes smaller countries nervous. Um, but in the report that you mentioned of um, the Franco-German report with the 12 experts, um, there were, they had some guardrails exactly. for QMV, such a sovereignty safety net um, um, that would be inspired by Article 31. Rebalancing of voting shares mm -hmm. is, is another possibility or an opt out for policy areas um, uh, which are of um, uh, going to Q, QMV. So there are um, proposals around already uh, significantly in those reports. But just uh, on that, I know that you, you had mentioned you were interested in getting some structural changes even before the European parliamentary elections that would perhaps lock in um, changes that that Alan mentioned uh, in case there was um, a tilt of the parliament. Do you feel that's feasible to have some changes before the European parliamentary election, some sort of um, uh, movement towards recent, um, structural changes? Well, I think the moment for that would have been now last December, so like uh, the, the, the European Council um, a few weeks ago. Uh, but unfortunately, in the lead up to that, there were so many other issues piling up um, that um, it wasn't possible. And the thing that was possible that was to agree that this discussion needs to take place and that it needs to be a, a key issue for the next legislature of the European Parliament and the Commission. So I think that's where we stand. We're still thinking a bit about whether there are things that can be done without sort of any big, um, uh, big, uh, big decisions or unanimous, un unanimous decisions, some reforms to make things faster, for instance, in the rule of law field. That's maybe something that could happen. Um, but I think uh, most of these discussions will have to take place um, after the elections with all the risk attached to it. Um, and um, yeah, but also one reason for my optimism is that uh, we have this group of friends actually of uh, qualified majority voting in the foreign affairs field um, already. Uh, where And this is really a group where we started out quite small with, I think, five uh, countries. And we are now, uh, I think, 11 or 12 full members plus a range of observer and, uh, observers. And also Ireland has joined this group as, uh, as an observer. Sorry. Um, to uh, to work with us here, particularly also on these issues like guardrails and uh, and safety nets and these kind of things. So, so that that really um, yeah is, is is a reason for why I think this could be possible because we're I mean as always in in politics we need to first have a have a a topic on the center of the stage like today <laughs> and uh, and talk about it. Uh, and develop some ideas and solutions and compromises, and then uh, we can also have the, the necessary votes. Yeah. Thank you. So, the gentleman down there had, um, and then up the back. Aren't you, Samuel Collin is my name. I'm a barrister practicing here in Dublin. And first of all, thank you, Minister, for your very interesting presentation coming to talk to us here today. And I was struck by your description of hiding, as it were, in, in the bomb shelter in Kiev. And, and I wonder to myself how you or I or any of us here would respond if we were sheltering from the far greater intensity of bombardment in Gaza being carried out by Israel with obviously international backing. And, and in that context, as someone who has an MA in peace studies, I was very interested to hear. I'm just wondering if you have any view on the application now being brought by the Republic of South Africa to the International Court of Justice against Israel, where obviously a very serious charge of genocide has been made. And, and as a follow up to that, if interim measures or indeed ultimately permanent measures are directed by the court, would, would it be your view that the European Union as a whole and the member states of the European Union, including, of course, Germany and Ireland, should comply in full with any directions issued by the court? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Oh, and it's really uh, the whole uh, suffering in the in the Middle East is really... Um... Yeah, on top of my mind, as, as on, on many minds um, uh, in the last uh, months, and, and it was really, I mean, this, this, this brutal attack by, by Hamas on, on, on Israel um, in October, it was really left many speechless. No? I mean, there were, 
uh, really uh, uh, violence uh, that targeted in innocent civilians uh, in, a, in a very um, uh, dramatic uh, way. Um, and, and now uh, when we look to Gaza and see the suffering there of, of, uh, of innocent civilians, um, that uh, come in between the the, the lines between uh, between Hamas and 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 uh, in the Israeli defense forces, uh, this is really a, a violence and suffering that needs to stop. I mean that's that's very clear, um, and it's a very uh, I mean as as many conflicts, it's, a, it's very complex because on the on the one hand, um, of course, Israel has the right to defend itself against uh, these these brutal attacks uh, that are still ongoing. Also, I mean there there are. Uh, bombs um, still uh, also targeting uh, Israel, also be it from from Gaza, but also from Houthis, from partially also uh, from the north, and um, so so that needs to stop. Uh, and also, it's also clear that um, that uh, the Israeli response to this uh, violence uh, needs to be in line with humanitarian law and needs to um, make sure that. Civilians are not targeted in that, in that way, and Annalena Baerbock was just in the region again and emphasized again to uh, to her uh, interlocutors that uh, there needs to be more humanitarian access and that these strikes um, against um, against Hamas need to be uh, more targeted and and um, and civilian lives need to be spared. Uh, we also argue, advocated for humanitarian pauses. Um, so there is indeed. Um, a need to to also say this uh, and and to 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 be clear that the Israeli response must be uh, proportionate. But uh, from our perspective, it's very clear that this um, doesn't amount to to genocide, and therefore we're we are not um, of course not uh, not uh, not supporting the the uh, the the case uh, made by by South Africa now um, and what is critical now is that the human suffering stops and that we come back to a track towards a political solution which can only evolve around the two state solutions uh, solution and and which uh, we are actively working on uh, trying uh, to get uh, the uh, sides to uh, to um, get to a stage where, where they can actually start talking about these things. Thank you, Minister. The, um, um, I have two more questions, but just one from the Zoom. Uh, retired Brigadier General Jara Hearn um, mentions the uh, recent questionable general election in Serbia. And his question is, does any formal process exist for the EU to temporarily suspend candidate status for countries that blatantly infringe the democratic process in their elections? I mean, does it exist? Is it, is it desirable? Is it, um, uh, how does one deal with, with the situation where, which has arisen in? Well, um, well, first of all, sort of the, or, now let me start with the general. So in general, yes, uh, the new uh, EU accession methodology follows uh, two clear principles. One is more for more. So countries that fulfill steps on the way to the EU should get more benefits from the EU if they uh, once they proceed. Uh, and at the same time, also less for less. So uh, talks on chapters can be frozen, stopped, Benefits uh, such as uh, funds can be uh, with uh, with withholden, um, and um, and that therefore the methodology exists. Also, just think about the frozen negotiations with Turkey. Huh? Uh, it was clear that that this wasn't going anywhere, so it's basically frozen at the moment. When it comes to to Serbia now, um, what we're doing at the moment is, I mean, we have we have um, made some some very clear statements also. Um, and now we're waiting for the final report from the election observers with sort of all the evidence collected, uh, which is expected in the coming weeks. And then I think indeed we need to um, discuss at EU level what consequence that has um, for also the accession negotiation process. And I don't think we can go back to business as usual. Thank you. The gentleman at the back had a question. Uh, thank you very much for your really interesting presentation. Andy McGuire from TU Dublin. 
for people who are here, that's Kettam Street and Bowden Street and what have you. Um, I, I, I find um, like people in this room um, think, and, and why we're here, we're, we're, we're thinking global and we want to act global and it's, it's wonderful, fantastic. And we're all very much a part of it. Um, and then you you mentioned um, like sustainability, and that kind of boils down to, you know, thinking global and acting local. Uh, and, and then you were talking about, and I think Alan Jukes mentioned it as well. There is the internal stability of the EU uh, with the existing systems, and and you know we can't take them for granted, as you know. Uh, and we talk about the right wing and how it's developing and we're comfortable with that. In Ireland, we have a political movement that seems to be gaining a strength that's not as right wing and likely to get into power next time round. And what I think that right wing crowd have in common with, with this new movement in Ireland is, is that they think local and act local. The EU, I feel strongly, and I'm so pro-European Union, you have no idea, it's been so good to me and to this country. Um, what can we do to, 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 to try and get the EU and its, its values and its perspectives to act and think more locally? For example, in Ireland, I think we've done something called the Citizens' Assembly, which I think has enhanced our political debate so much because it's taken off the agenda, the stuff on the side. Um, are there things in Germany that you're doing to enhance democracy beyond elections? Or what do you think of the Irish Citizens' Assembly and can that be replicated? Can you can I have thoughts on that about strengthening values within the Union? Thanks. Excellent question. Right, right, right on point. Um, first, uh, yes, we're very inspired by the Irish Citizen Assemblies. In fact, we're so inspired that we've been copying them uh, in Germany. So we've already had, I think, now three uh, attached to the national parliament. Um, they have not uh, gained such a prominence in the public discussion, unfortunately, in Germany as they have in Ireland, even though in terms of methods, they were quite are very similar, but somehow they haven't fully sort of had that impact that that uh, that I think probably most citizens in Germany don't know that we have citizens assemblies now. Um, so we really need to think a bit about how we can improve that. Maybe really find some very, very controversial topic uh, that then everyone really also reports about these citizen assemblies. Maybe that that's one thing. Um, they have also been used at the EU level, you know, in connection with the Conference on the Future of Europe. But I think there, uh, unfortunately, the Irish example wasn't followed so closely. So there were citizen assemblies, but on a very, very broad topic, namely the future of Europe, uh, and with a very unclear link of those citizen assemblies to then what came out of this conference. So I think methodologically that, that here in Ireland, yeah, we sh it's done better with a very focused topic, with a lot of expert input, and with a clear link then uh, of the citizen assembly to what happens in parliament and the political process afterwards. So that's that's clearly an inspiration from Ireland. And um, yeah, and I think in general though, these citizen assemblies are one step, but not enough to, to really bring the EU and also democratic institutions in general closer to citizens. One answer of course is also to strengthen the local level to give more power to the local level, to let more decide, more issues decide there. That's one of the things that we've been been advocating as we or work, work for. Mm -hmm. And I think as EU, um, and particularly also now in the coming months, we just need to over and over and over again really um, talk a lot about what you said, what the EU has ever done actually for every citizen for everyday life and 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 as such i think that's that must be the answer yeah just shout a bit louder uh, i think this has to be the last question um thank you, thank you very uh, member of the board of iiea i want to pick up your your point uh, minister uh, the law the need for unanimity to change unanimity um a uh, context we've had in Ireland since 1972 nine referenda on European issues, six treaties and the fiscal compact. 
And on the Nice Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, we thought they were so good that we voted twice, uh, which brings the, the, the number to, to, to nine. Clearly, there is a risk in holding a referendum on very sovereignty-sensitive questions, how do you protect your national interest and so on. And I'm interested to know in the Friends of QMV group that you mentioned, um, to what extent are you seeking to find your creative solutions within the boundaries of the existing treaties as a de-risking mechanism to deliver the outcomes that are desirable? Uh, thank you very much. I mean, this is really, um, you know, the absurd situation is that the existing treaty has this so-called passerelle clause that you probably know, but for, mm -hmm. for, for everyone else also. So it, it says in the existing EU treaties that in certain areas we can move to QMV without any treaty change, right? So it's already in the treaty, it was foreseen that there might be a point in time, for instance, an enlargement or something else, where we need this flexibility. So also all countries already have agreed to this potential huh, back uh, when they agreed to the treaty. Unfortunately, that uh, is basically a pregnant, non-pregnant thing, right? Either you do it or you don't. But in order to get actually the majorities to do it, some creativity and something in between actually would be desirable. But there, our lawyers are not very certain at the moment if any creativity wouldn't actually require a treaty change. So, and it's actually a bit of an absurd situation. So if you go all the way, you don't need treaty change. And if you do something in between, you might need treaty change. So, um, yeah, but, uh, but we're working on that. And that's exactly also one of the reasons why I'm so insistent and almost really, I think I, by now I annoy a lot of my colleagues in, in the General Affairs Council in Brussels because I keep on emphasizing this issue that we need to start the reform discussion now so that we're really ready once the candidate countries are ready because all sorts of questions come along the way, right? Uh, these legal questions, um, and, and indeed, um, there are many ways of, of improving and changing things within the treaties. Uh, you know, as German government, we are also open for, for treaty change, um, and there might be some ways there, but apparently now in many countries, there's not much appetite for treaty change. So, um, so we'll have to see. There are also other options of including these kind of reforms into the enlargement treaties themselves. That's also something that's being discussed. Uh, because they will have to be ratified um, anyway. Um, so there are yeah, all sorts of discussions that we're having at the moment and uh, really a discussion that needs to be also held in all EU member states uh, with creative solutions coming uh, from, uh, from all member states. So I really encourage you to uh, think about these issues, to come up with also your own suggestions and ideas. And during the next legislature of the European Parliament will be a time where, where they will be taken into into consideration. So thanks a lot. So Minister, thank you very much indeed. I think um, we owe you a great debt for coming to share your views, uh, the German um, government's views, um, but also uh, to address uh, an issue which I think we are all aware is at the very top of the EU agenda at the moment, the issue of enlargement. Uh, and also um, for assisting us here to become more aware uh, of the threat assessment uh, of uh, that is facing the EU in relation to European security. Uh, and I think this is something that we, we really have to work on enhancing public appreciation that um, uh, what the moves that are um, underway in Europe uh, to promote enlargement uh, affects us all uh, in terms of European security. So we thank you most sincerely for that and um, uh, hope that we can continue discussions with between Germany and Ireland and uh, as partners within the EU. And um, once again, many thanks. Just before we close, our head of research, Barry, wanted to have a few words, if you just for two minutes, he says. Good evening, words. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm 
Barry called for the direct research. Lovely to have everybody here. Just a cooler fuckle at the end. Just to echo Mary's thanks, obviously, for Dr. Lerman and team. It's been great to have you here, but also Mary as well for your skillful chairing as ever. I also just, in addition to uh, the thanks for the Department of Foreign Affairs, which Mary mentioned at the start, I also just want to stress our appreciation for the German embassy here in uh, in Dublin, Ambassador Cord and Christian Resch at the back of the room there as well. Uh, you're great supporters of the Institute and it's always great to work with you. So thanks very much for your support. I just want to mention quickly, the 2024 programme is very much up and running. Um, two dates for your diary, which may be of interest. On the 22nd of this month, we're delighted that we're going to welcome with Canadian colleagues, the Catherine Stewart, who's Canada's climate change ambassador, is going to be here alongside Dr. Catherine Welsh from the Department of Foreign Affairs, talking about the outcomes from COP28. And then also one to look forward to on the 6th of February, the EU sanctions envoy, David O'Sullivan, who was also late of this parish, a former director general, is going to be talking to us about the EU sanctions on Russia. There's much more as well available on the IA website, but there are two in-person events that are coming up. I look forward to seeing some of you there. Thanks very much for being with us and uh, have a, a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you.